You know, so many of us act like um, we're not engaged in warfare. <clears throat> well, I'm here to tell you today that there is a war going on. Now, it's not with the banks or the financial system. That's maybe a result of something that uh, the devil has uh, got a stronghold in. But um, the Bible tells us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Um, and the uh, Bible's very clear about this battle there. When Paul wrote to young Timothy, who you know, was a, a young preacher at the time, he said this. He said, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you wage the good warfare. 1 Timothy 1.18. What he was saying was, Son, you are in a battle, a warfare, and it's not easy. So, be strong. Um, the same young man, Paul wrote this to, he said, Endure hardness or hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's in 2 Timothy 2, 3. Now, I know that Paul used a lot of military terminology, but, um, and you know, he used a lot of metaphors. Uh, but the truth is, here... It's not metaphorical in the sense that he's just trying to get a point across. Um, in warfare, there are soldiers. Amen? And, and, and that we know quite clearly that, that there is a, a spiritual battle going on. Now, um, soldiers are there to fight. That's what soldiers do. Uh, they don't spend all their time on the parade ring, if you notice that, you know, just parading. They actually go into battle. And um, they're expected to be tough and resilient. And that's why it says, endure hardness or hardship. Um, and you endure hardship or hardness in training <laughs> as well as in battle. So we have to have both. Many of us don't act like we're in a spiritual battle. And I think this is really probably the most common deception that the devil um, traps us with. Uh, so if he can get you to wage warfare with your own weapons, then he's got you. Because whatever you have, let me tell you, it isn't sufficient and never will be. You know, I don't care whether you're the president of America. I, you know, I don't care how much influence you have, how much your abilities are, you know, how greatly gifted you are. Whatever you try and use, you will not succeed. Now, he will allow you with your own abilities and your own success and your own weaponry to maybe be successful. But um, when he wants to pull you down, he can pull you down. I'm not prophesying that. I'm just saying that th that's this, this, uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God. And we'll see that, that, that there are two primary weapons that we have. And uh, they equip us to win. We aren't... It's never been intended that the body of Christ lose. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So today we're going to look at, you know, this warfare, this war that is, is raging in, in, in the spirit realm. And, um, you know, you can say, oh, Pastor Chris, well, you know, I don't want to be devil conscious. I want to be Christ conscious. Well, that's fine with me because I, I preach that. But we shouldn't be ignorant about spiritual matters. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to understand what's going on. Um, you know, in a couple of days, uh, we have a 9-11 anniversary. Um, and, uh, you know, Chris Hyman was actually there in, in, in the building. And I, he will tell you there's a spiritual dimension to that. Anyone that was near there will know there's a spiritual dimension to that. And, uh, and, and you know, the devil has a mandate, and that is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. 
Jesus came that we might have life and have life super abundant. I mean, totally different mandates. But he is bent on achieving what he has, has uh, um, uh, put his mind and heart to. But Christ has already come up with the spoils. Amen. Which gives us the ability to take him on and defeat him. Uh, now, we're going to go through quite a lot of scripture, but I believe the Spirit of God is going to stir us up because some of us have been mesmerized into that place where we're trying to take this on and we're not breaking through, we're not achieving it because we're doing it in our own strength with our own abilities. We don't realize that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical. They're not human in any respect. That they are mighty through God. They are spiritual weapons. And until we use them... Do you know, you can't even keep your flesh under on your own strength. You need the Holy Spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Now, I know some of you think you can. Let me tell you, you can't. You can beat yourself up. You can do whatever you want. The moment, even Paul said, the things I do, I find... I, 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 don't want to do the things I don't want to do. I find myself doing so. What a wretched man I am. But then he says that, well, praise God for Christ Jesus. Praise God for the Holy Spirit because through him he's able to cope with all that. Left to our own devices, we, we're the same. Uh, Paul was always conscious of warfare. At the end of his life's journey, he said, I have fought a good fight. And tells me that he was in a battle. Amen? And I have finished my course. I kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, 7. In Ephesians 6, 11, he tells his readers, put on the whole armor of God. Um, you have a choice every morning. You can get up. You can just leave your armor in the corner of the room to get dusty. Or you can put it on. But he says, put on the whole armor of God. Why armor? Because we're soldiers. I mean, it's not because God wants you to look pretty. Because we are in battle. A spiritual war is raging. So put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the strategies of the devil. He's got plans. He's got strategies. And you can't stand against them unless you've got your armor on. What we need to clearly understand is mentioned in verse 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is not a battle against people. This is not a battle against mere human opposition. We are in a conflict against supernatural forces. If we listen to the terminology that Paul uses, we will notice that the opposing army has some serious authoritative ranking officers. Listen to them. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, in high places. We tell you, you're not matched to them. Some of them have been around for thousands of years. Some of them are governing certain territories. But praise God, we don't have to be fearful of that. But if you use your own weapons, you struggle. But we have weapons. No soldier is a soldier without a weapon. So what are we fighting over? First, let me say this. It's not over what we often think it is. Unless who we are and what we are involved in is a threat to the devil's rule, these forces of evil are not that interested in you. Don't think that the devil is preventing you from getting a new handbag or buying a new car or something. <laughs> He's not into, you know, that's not going to affect his rule. But the moment you get involved in God's work, in the extension of his kingdom here on earth, then it winds him up. Amen? 
So, the Bible says that the kingdom of God will be taken by force and forceful men. Will apprehend it. So, this is a real battle. Don't think that the devil is just going to sit back when you get involved. He has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. It's the same in any conflict. It has to do with territorial control. This battle is about supremacy. Either Christ or Satan. It's a struggle for the souls of men. It's a battle to keep people out of hell. It's a struggle to get people saved. It is warfare, a conflict until the finish. And every one of us is engaged in it, whether we like it or not. Now, even now, have you sensed the spiritual climate's changed? Serious. Have you feel It changed the moment I started to speak about this. Why? Because he's wound up. Oh, but the devil's not in church. No, he comes immediately to steal the word. So that tells me he's here. Amen. But there are greater forces here. There are angels around us. There is, there is God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit here. But the devil is still going to try and steal the word. Why? Because the moment you get the knowledge that you're going to get today, he knows he's defeated. I saw something, you know, that really blessed me. Now, Jesus was taken into the wilderness, led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted or tested, in fact. Uh, I think they needed to establish the difference, this is the Godhead, between the old Adam and this Adam, you know, Jesus Christ. So Holy Spirit said, right, go in, devil needs to know who you are. And the devil tried the three things, Lust of the eyes, um, uh, lust of the, the, the flesh, and the, the pride of life. He, t- he tempted him exactly the same way he tempted uh, the first Adam, except Jesus could not be tempted. Now, he used something that we have. It's called the sword of the Spirit. And I love this. I'm just going to read you the end, because every time... The devil came at him. Jesus had the sword of the Spirit. As I said, he was um, uh, tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But he kept saying, it is written. It is written. Now, isn't Jesus God? Didn't Jesus say, all authority is mine, and hand it over to the church? Now, why didn't Jesus use that authority? Could have. It could have even said, Satan, you know, just get out of here. He didn't. He used the word of God. He used the sword of the Spirit. Thought about that. He had all authority, but he chose not to because he was showing us how to deal with those situations. We have the same... If he, just, if he just acted like God, we could never relate to him. But he said, it is written. You have the word of God. Amen. Amen? And you should have a reservoir in you of the word of God that you can dip into. And when the devil comes, you can say, it is written. Use the sword of the Spirit and you can defeat him. Amen. Here's the bit I like. He used the sword of the Spirit. And then it says, Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. There's no evidence of the devil ever confronting Jesus again until the cross. That was the opportune time. Think about that. The sword of the Spirit is so effective against him that he chooses himself not to come back. Are you getting, are you grasping this? 
You see, we can go around and we can do an hour and shout at God and pray to God all day and, you know, rattle God's cage and try and get God to do something when God's already done it. He's given us his word. He says, use his word. Use my word. That's where you get the results. Not all this other stuff, which makes you feel more righteous, more holy, more spiritual after all, you know. No. Jesus, in this instance, just used the word. Amen. Amen. And let me tell you, he was not at his strongest. This is 40 days he was tested (laughs) in the wilderness. So what am I saying? I'm saying I, I feel so much of the time we are trapped and tricked into just leaning on our own understanding, our own abilities, uh, trying to use our own weapons or weapons that we think are effective against the devil when, in fact, we have his word. And that's all we need. You know, the average Christian isn't really a soldier. You know, if you look at their lives, they don't act like soldiers. They don't, they're not disciplined. They're not, you know, um, focused. Uh, they don't endure hardship. They're not as persistent. Most people are not really engaged in a spiritual struggle. They're not fighting anything, not standing for any cause. We must take on the cause of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus came and he had a cause. Amen. Amen. We've got to take on his cause. We ought to penetrate the darkness with the light of Christianity. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, that talks a lot about testosterone, doesn't it? You know, it's, it's about going in and taking it. It's very, very militant. Why is it militant? Because there's opposition. The gates of hell aren't there to stop us. They're there to be broken down. Gates of hell shall not prevail. I mean, they can't prevail. I mean, we just push them open. We go and plunder hell, populate heaven. We're definitely in warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. This leads me to the most important truth of all. As I said, there are two weapons. In fact, it's one weapon that's used with the help of the Holy Spirit. So... Although the Holy Spirit is a a weapon in himself, because we have resurrection power with him, he always uses the sword of the Spirit. The Lord didn't leave us without anything to go into battle with. As we read earlier, we have an armor that we can put on. And um, if you closely examine your armor... Uh, and uh, someone's done a sort of study of this. The only place that's exposed is the smaller your back. And the only way the devil can get you is if you're fleeing. So like I said, put on the whole armor of God and stand. And then keep, keep standing. Because if you keep standing, he can't do anything. The moment you turn around and flee. In fact, if we draw to God, God draws near to us and the devil flees from us. And every day he flees. We don't flee. So put on the whole armor of God. Every morning. Helmet protects your head. Breastplate protects your vital organs, your chest. Gird yourself. That protects... You know, 
everything that you do that, that it, it's got to do with reproduction. Your feet are shod. You know, there's nothing. You have a shield. You can stand, and the shields are, are full length. So you can actually stand behind the shield, and it, says, uh, and it extinguishes the fiery darts. Love to make a movie about that. You know, as these darts come, they just get extinguished of, of the devil. And then you have the sword of the Spirit. Everything that God has given you, he's given you because he wants you to win. But they're, they're not physical. They're almighty through God. Personality or talent or gifting has nothing to do with it. The weapons of our warfare are not physical. The Bible is full of illustrations of that. I, I love the story of Moses and the Amalekites. And, um, you know, now remember, he's not fighting this battle. He sends Joshua and, you know, a bunch of the lads in to go and, and do the battle. And he's up there, and every time he raises his hands, guess what? They win. And then he gets tired. And they lose. So then, you know, he puts his hands up again, and they win. And he figures out, whoa, look at this. Now, you know, and we know the story, you know. To, to, <laughs> yeah, man on either side of him keeping his hands up. But let me ask you something. Did Moses ever go into warfare, physical warfare? Was he, did he ever attack an Amalekite himself? No. It was a spiritual battle. Do you see? He held his hands up. You know, he was on the mountaintop. They were down in the valley fighting, but he was able to dictate the outcome of that battle. It's the same with us. We don't have to go into the valley with our swords and go and battle. We just have to stand on the mountaintop and praise God. Yes. Hallelujah. It says that um, when he held up his hands towards heaven, and he lifted them toward God that the children of Israel won. Whenever he got tired, guess what? The enemy got gained ascendancy. Well, he wasn't using natural weapons. He was using spiritual weapons. Note, the most effective weapon we have is the Word of God. There is absolutely nothing like it. Ephesians 6 tells us that one of our weapons is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Can you imagine a soldier going off to fight and not having a weapon? Why would God call us a soldier and expect us to take on the battle without weaponry? He's given us one thing. It's the most effective thing. That's why Jesus used it. That's why Jesus didn't use his authority. He just used what we have. The sword of the Spirit. God has given you his word. Now, if I don't use this, if I don't use my sword, like all swords, they get rusty, blunt. You know, some of you have probably never taken it out of its sheath. So how do I know that? Because you've got to study the Word. If you love God's Word, you can't wait to spend time in it, to learn more about it, to study, to, to get more knowledge. Hallelujah. You know, I took a lot of time and effort to put together a website for people that love the world, word. I am absolutely astounded at the lack of interest. Honestly, I'm astounded that people, when they've got an opportunity to go and study the word, there are some incredible study tools, incredible things that you can source to help you. It's actually a little 
um, gadget on there that will help you read the Bible in a year chronologically. In other words, you read it like one story. And you know what it takes 15 minutes of the day? This is what God's given us. You know, I, look, I can stand up here and say without any fear of contradicting myself that I love this more than anything. And that's why I'm amazed and people don't love it. Can't say, well, this is what he's given us. You know, if you don't have it, if you don't have a reservoir in you of the word, if you're not constantly asking for fresh revelation of the word. You can't run on yesterday's manner. Oh, well, God told me 10 years ago to do something. Sorry, it's stale. It stinks. Full of worms. Just like the manna was if they didn't eat it before midday. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word. Rima that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We've got to hear from Him. We've got to hear from Him. And He speaks through His Word. Stop waiting for someone to prophesy over you. That's not how we it designed. This is New Testament. God has put His Holy Spirit in you. Amen. He's given you His Word. When, when He wants you to hear... You study his word, the Holy Spirit breathes life onto it, and you hear. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Right. And then when someone does come along prophesy over you, they always prophesy in line with God's word, and it witnesses with your spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Everything is about the word. Amen. Notice the weapons that we have are mighty. Are mighty. Through God. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, human, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. They're not mighty in me. They're not mighty through me. They're mighty in him. They're mighty through him. It's the vessel, God Almighty, that releases this power that determines what's going to happen. I cannot achieve what I need to achieve for his plan and purpose on this earth without that mighty power at work in and through me. But he releases it because it comes through him. It is his power. What else has he given us? He's given us the Holy Spirit in spiritual warfare. I think of the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, you have the Spirit of God living in you. Fact. Paul, is, when writing to the church in Corinth, said, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? See, the Holy Spirit didn't come to live in temples made by human hands. It came to live in us. He is in us. And in spiritual warfare, we've got to ask him. We've got to ask him to help us engage in it. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's uh, Zechariah 4, verse 6. These are not ordinary days we're living in. Now, if you have any kind of perception, you will know that things have changed. The world order has changed. Something is going on. But it's going on in the spirit. Amen. Amen. Our enemy is not an ordinary foe. Just ordinary human weapons will never secure the victory. We have the same powerful weapons and the same mighty God that Moses had. God's power 
was available for a young David when he slew Goliath. What did he have? He had a sling and a smooth pebble from the brook. But I'd rather have a sling and a pebble and God on my side than the mighty sword of Goliath. We need not quake in fear in the presence of the enemy, for God's word says, in all these things, say all these things, we are more than conquerors. Say that. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. I don't care what you're going through. It's a thing. You're going through things. In all these things, you are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. Praise God. Yes, we are more than conquerors. So no enemy can stand against the church of Jesus Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, that is a guarantee. What's the difference between a promise and a guarantee? I can promise you something that I can't guarantee. God guarantees it. God has actually said, listen, if you use the weapon that I've given you, the word of God, I guarantee the victory. Hallelujah. I guarantee the victory. Now, what is the guarantee? Guarantee is that if we use his word, if we take him at his word, guess what? We win. From beginning to end, it's full of winning scripture. There's nowhere that you will find in God's Bible that says that you're going to lose. That you're going to be defeated. No. Even in death, there's victory. We win, no matter what. Hallelujah. Thing is, how much do you love that? How often do you use it? How often do you study it? How keen are you to get more of it? It's like Dajon says, if your, bubble, if your Bible is worn, you aren't. If the pages of your Bible are still sticking together, maybe your life's still sticking together wrong. Your Bible should be something you never discard. Oh, I'm in a problem. What can I do? And you sit and scheme out every way you think, God, to get out of it instead of just picking the word of God up and saying, Lord, I'm going to study. I'm going to read. Show myself approved. And guess what? I know there's an answer. Yeah, I'll find an answer. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Hmm. We have three, wep- uh, three enemies, the flesh, the world, and the devil. Jesus says, I've overcome the world. He's defeated the devil and leaves the flesh. Well, again, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Again, we can pull down every stronghold, anything that is in opposition to God. And the battle is in the mind a lot of the time. It says that we can tear down those strongholds and make them obedient to Christ. What is obedient? The Greek word there is if you hear something and submit to it. What are you hearing? You're hearing the living word, the logos. And you're saying, I'm going to obey. And because you obey, you have the victory. So wherever you go in God's word, always comes back to how much are you being obedient to God's word? Amen. 
whatever stronghold has been formed in your life, whether it's your relationship with the world system, whether it's your you know, compulsive habits or your flesh, whether it's a conflict, a genuine conflict you're having with the devil, and there's a stronghold there. All of those strongholds can be torn down with the weapon that you have. I didn't say it. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's their objective. I love the, the way God sort of makes it clear. In Revelation 12, verse 11, it says, that They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Again, I have no testimony until I'm obedient to this. The word of my testimony is completely tied to my obedience to God's word. That's where the victory is. That's where the victory is. I'm not afraid to go into battle as long as I've got this. Why should I be? Jesus is my example. You know, we can bury our heads in the sand and we can say, well, you know, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines and watch the battle. If you're a Christian, it's too late. You're on the sidelines, you're going to get nailed. You're a target. So you might as well engage. Amen. 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 Why? Because when you're engaging, you're winning. I see lots of men and women of valor, courageous men and women that are here today. I see men and women that will outlast the battle, whatever you're going through, outlast the battle and get the spoils of the war. You're more than a conqueror. But you need to let the enemy know you mean business. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Shall not prevail against the church. That's you and me. So I want you this week, because whatever battle you're going through, and if you say I'm not going through a battle, well, you're not looking in the right place. Because there is a spiritual battle. Everyone's engaged in it. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're sensing, pick up God's Word. Study God's Word. Get revelation concerning God's Word and your situation. And then use your spirit. Be bold. Amen. Put on the whole armor of God. Get your shield of faith up. Why? Because sometimes you just need to chill a little. And you, with faith is, is, is actually a place of rest. When, when you're living by faith, you're not living in anxiety or stress. It's a place of rest. So behind your shield is a place of rest. But then when you get the revelation, when you get that word, then un take out your sword unsheath it and give the devil what Jesus gave him. It is written. Hallelujah. I guarantee victories because there's nowhere else where I can find an alternative to that. Not in here. It's all about the word. It's all about. God has limited himself to his word. Why? Because he trusts his word. He trusts his word. <laughs> Do you trust it? 
do you trust that it'll do exactly what he said it would do? Now, I want us to just finish now by overcoming some of the timidity that we've acquired, whether we've acquired it through our upbringing, through our culture, or whatever. See, there's no way that you can be the person God has created you to be and be timid as well. You do not have the spirit of fear or timidity, the spirit of love, power, and of a sound mind. And if you remain in a place of timidity, you never achieve what God has designed and purposed for you. Because you have to have a militant spirit. You have to have a militant spirit. Now, it doesn't mean that externally you walk around like a terrorist. <laughs> but the moment the enemy is there, do what every soldier does. Draw your sword. Well, first, put on all your armor. You know, get your shield in place. And draw your sword and go for him. Amen. We're too tolerant. Absolutely too tolerant. We're too timid. You can't offend the devil. He is the cause of every offense. Oh, but that's not me. It is you. It is you. Because the way that God deals with evil is always violence. Doesn't walk in every. It's a violent spirit. He's here to kill, to steal, and destroy. I told you the story about my mum, who's a tiny little woman, and uh, she was in her 80s, and someone walked into her house to rob her. And you know, it's quite common in South Africa. You know, they just take a chance. They see the doors open. My mum always had her doors open. This guy walks in, obviously to do damage. She grabs the broom. <laughs> and she just goes for him, right? And just starts to... The guy ran out of the house. <laughs> That's what you should be doing to the devil. Yeah. Not making him a cup of tea and trying to <laughs> talk to him. And, no. No. Oh, can we discuss it? I mean, they're sure we can find an amicable solution. <laughs> For what? He's here to kill, to steal, and destroy. Get him out of your house. Yeah. Amen. Get him out of your family. Get him out of your business. Get him out of your relationship. You know, get him out. Whatever it takes. Get him out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's where the victory is. And if you're still timid, come and speak to me and I'll pray for you. <laughs> you might get a little slap across the face at the same time, but that's fine. It might just wake you up a little. We're not supposed to be all timid and obliging to the devil and the evil forces. There are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. I mean, they are bent on achieving their aims and their goals. But you have in your hand the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. And what happened with Jesus where he went away until the appropriate time. He knew that he couldn't do anything. So he thought, well, I'm just going to wait and wait and wait and wait. And then he saw his moment at the cross. Well, I'd rather have that then have to deal with him every second of the day. If you're dealing with him on the same thing day in and day out, it's because you've not used the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit. And if you have, you've not believed it. 
It doesn't have power unless you believe it. Hallelujah. It is written. Amen. For it to be written, you have to read it. Now, it's wonderful coming to church, and thank you all for coming. I'm blessed. Hallelujah. But you get more revelation reading than anything else. You, again, going back to the website, that's the whole point. If you love God's Word, you want to read it, you want to study it, you want to get more information about it, you want to just have piles and piles of stuff that you can look at. Amen? Because when you read, there's something that God does in you. The connection between you reading, your mind absorbing, and God breathing life on it is just absolutely awesome. Now you get the rima by coming to church because you're getting fed here. Amen? But studying is a whole different thing. Yeah? Today's food. Study is life. Man, it's a lifestyle. Study. I got uh, to know the Lord late in life. You know, some of you got to know him when you were six, and you know, like Lorraine, and some others maybe even younger. You just connected with God, and that was it. As I said, mine was sort of later, my twenties. And the first thing that struck me when I came to to Christ was how important it was for me to study his word. I couldn't get enough of his word. And that became a a lifestyle. But I was also blessed that in the church I was involved in, it was part of the church culture. We would not leave church without going into the bookshop and buying a set of tapes to listen to. Every Sunday. What else can I go and find to, to listen to? What, what other book can I find to read? That's the culture. Now, is that God, godly? Absolutely. You know, look, I'm having a bit of a go at you today, but let me tell you, I'll tell you why. Because we are in a spiritual battle. Amen. Now, I have a duty to say to you, look, wake up. And stop letting the devil just have his way with you. So I I have to tell you, listen, you are wrong in the attitude that you have, thinking you can get by without study, without diligent study of God's Word, without spending the time that's necessary. Saying, oh, well, Pastor Chris, well, you don't know. Well, uh, listen, if I'm wrong, fine. But if I'm right for one person, I'm fine as well. Amen? Amen. Because one life can be saved because you've got the word. Change the culture of, well, I can do with dating God. I come and meet up with him on a Sunday. And, you know, the rest of the week. No, if you love God, you love his word. Amen. 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 It's as simple as that. So you spend as much time in his word as you can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I promise you, this nation is going to be transformed through Christians that get hold of that message and run with it. Because we can go out into the marketplace and we can change things by the power of His Word. Well, we have a spiritual battle, not people. We can only take that battle on with the sword of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. And there has to be a militant spirit. Yeah. You've got to be determined that you're going to take ground. You are going to yeah. occupy territory. You are going to give glory yeah. to God. And you know what? God showed me that every inch that we take is there for eternity. Yeah. The only way he can get it back is if we give it back to him. But he cannot take it back once we have moved in and claimed it. Wherever our foot has tread... It is God's. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've cut, you know, we've chiseled some bit of heaven in this area. We've been here 22 years. Let me tell you, there is an open heaven here. 
But we've done that. We need to create open heavens everywhere. Do it in the Spirit. We trust you enjoyed this program. For more information on Life Matters and Cornerstone Church, visit our website at www.cornerstonechurch.com. We hold our Sunday services at 10.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. at Sandown Park, Asia, Surrey. We are a family church where all are welcome.